It's important to find the truth about who murdered the president because there was an official governmental investigation. And it uh, seems to me as, as a one humble American, very proud of being an American, uh, that when the government investigates who assassinated our precious president, that we find out. And it, at the very least, if we can't find out, we tell the American people what we did find out during the course of the investigation and the reasons why we weren't able to find out exactly what happened. And that should have been done. And it wasn't done. Basically, Joe Kennedy promised the mob the White House. You elect my son, and the White House is yours. Well, what do they do? They thought they elected his son, because Illinois is the one that flipped it in West Virginia. Well, who flipped it in Illinois? None other but Chicago. And they felt like they got Kennedy elected. So when Bobby steps in, they felt betrayed. In the spring and summer of 1963, according to credible federal witnesses, Three major mafia figures were all discussing plots to kill John and Robert Kennedy, John or Robert. Uh, Carlos Marcello, mafia boss of New Orleans, uh, spoke about killing President Kennedy. Santos Traficante, mafia boss of Tampa, uh, predicted that Kennedy would be killed. And Jimmy Hoffa, who was the Teamster boss, who was close with both Traficanti and Marcello is asking an FBI informant to procure some explosives to murder Robert Kennedy. The Mafia stood to lose millions after Castro kicked them out of Cuba and ended what could be called Cuba's role as a client state for the mob. Prior to November 22, 1963, the mob were in bed with CIA. Years before, they connected through a guy by the name of Robert Mayhew, who was a retired FBI agent, that put the Chicago mob together with the CIA and came up with the operation to kill Castro. CIA unchecked, no checks and balances on them, basically ran their own ship, didn't answer to anybody, and Kennedy, at that time was about to disband him. He wasn't happy with the Bay of Pigs. He wasn't happy with all the operations they had going to kill Castro. He was rather embarrassed by some of the operations they had going. He fired Dulles and he fired General Cabell. And strangely enough, the mayor of Dallas, Texas is General Cabell's brother. Kennedy also was having second thoughts on our involvement in Vietnam. Soon after taking office, he had been confronted with a crisis in the Southeast Asian nation of Laos, where the communist Patet Lao were fighting against the CIA-supported General Pumi Novasan. As in the Bay of Pigs invasion, all of Kennedy's advisors, including the Joint Chiefs of Staff, urged him to send in U.S. troops. But again, he declined. So, you had the military against him, Johnson and Kennedy hated each other. Just prior to his death, Kennedy signed National Security Action Memorandum 263, which effectively called for the return of all U.S. troops from Vietnam by the end of 1965. Kennedy's disengagement orders were countermanded only days after his assassination by the security memorandum authorized by his successor, Lyndon Johnson. You know, you talk about conspiracy, you talk about how could it last for 40 years without somebody in the conspiracy saying anything. Former Special Agent Zach Sheldon was an agent who worked under my supervision. He had called me and uh, presented to me the stage of the investigation on the Kennedy assassination that he had been conducting independently. It was quite obvious from our conversation that Zach had the investigators fire for the uh, investigation, which to a certain degree concerned me. And I wanted Zach, and I told him at this time, 
to kind of step back and don't let your emotions run, but hold yourself as the investigator and let the information facts flow. I entered on duty with the FBI in 1970 and became an agent in 1973 where I went to Kansas City, Missouri, then Chicago, Illinois, and then the Houston Division. When I was in Kansas City and Chicago, my main investigative duties was on the Organized Crime Squad. Since retiring in 1998 from the FBI, I have uh, spent a lot of time investigating the Kennedy assassination. Why do we want to open up? this sore again. Has there not been enough, Zach, uh, facts, warrant commission, books written, documentaries written? What makes your information so different and unique than what has previously uh, been presented? We then decided at this time that Zach must convince me as the old supervisor, that there was sufficient information here where I would authorize an investigation, meaning predication, a purpose. Why, why spend the effort? I've had an occasion to now review the evidence that has been gathered by Zach. We'd already crossed the threshold of predication, reason to investigate. After reviewing the evidence, in information, in my opinion, it has reached the point which I would call probable cause. We have got to go over that information, realize that maybe certain mistakes were made. Maybe there were certain agendas that had to be taken care of for national security. Well, now is the time for truth to come forward. In approximately 1979 or 1980 in Chicago, I had an investigation involving James Files. Uh, in this investigation, I identified uh, the, the fact that Files was hijacking tractor trailer loads of merchandise and bringing them to Chicago and selling them. Uh, we were able to purchase three of these loads, and with conversation, uh, that we had with Files, uh, it, was, it was known that he was definitely a, say, not a godchild, but basically a uh, really running buddy of Chuck Nicoletti's. Also at that same time, Files was involved in a chop shop operation and was bringing these vehicles down to Dallas, Texas. Through this investigation, I was able to come very close to an individual that Files knew. And this individual told me that once in Dallas, Texas, they went through Daly Plaza. Files became very weird, made a comment to the effect that if the American people really knew what happened, no one would be able to handle it. This statement, I felt, was definitely made, or this individual wouldn't have told me this. The question then was, why did Files make that statement? Joe West is a private investigator whose investigation of the Kennedy assassination began in 1989. In 1992, he meets former FBI Special Agent Zach Shelton. I told Joe West about this comment that Files had made in 1979 and told him if he really wanted to check up on a good lead, he should find Files. And at that time, I knew Files was incarcerated somewhere in the United States. Initially, Files was very reluctant to talk to Joe West. Particularly, West established a relationship with Files. Through months of personal visits and detailed correspondence, Files began to reveal his participation in the JFK assassination, but would only confess if he were granted immunity from prosecution. West was negotiating immunity from Texan authorities when he became ill and suddenly passed away in 1993. As Files had come to respect Joe West, his death was a major factor in his willingness to come forward with the confession that West had been seeking from him. Uh, when Joe West first originally contacted me here at Stateville Prison, I was on a visit. The counselor came in the visiting room where I was at and stated that she wanted me to come out and make a phone call. I told her, I said, no way, I'm here 365 days a year. 
I'm not leaving my visit to go make a phone call. I said, who's calling? He told me someone from Texas named Joe West. I told him, I do not know the party. I said, tell them I'll call them on my time, not their time. I'm on a visit. Don't bother me when I'm on a visit. The next day, they come got me out of my cell. They took me downstairs and got a phone call hooked up. I called Joe West to talk to him. I told him, you have three minutes to convince me why I should talk to you. As Joe started talking to me, I told him, I said, whoa, stop. I said, you're on a lot of touchy spots. I said, these phone calls are recorded. Every phone call going in and coming out is recorded. If you want to talk to me that bad, then I suggest you come and visit me. Joe West had me put him on his visiting list. He come up to visit me. He spent two days up here talking with me. The first day, I wouldn't even talk to him about the Kennedy situation. We got into uh, sports, weather, generally by prison, local things till I got comfortable with him. The next day, after I thought it over all night, Joe West seemed like a pretty nice guy. I really liked Joe. He had a magnetism about him. The next day, we sat down, we got serious, and then we started talking. I sit in the dining or in the visiting room with Joe. They gave us a pencil and paper. I sketched the entire Lily Plaza out for him without any maps, without any pictures, nothing present. And I explained to Joe at that time, because Joe wanted to know where was I at. And I said, I'm going to put an X on the paper to signify me, but this X is not in the correct spot. I said, when the time comes, then I will put the X where it is supposed to be. And he said that someone had informed him that I was there. He said he had a reliable source. And I didn't know for quite a while who that source was. It was quite some time later before I learned the fact that the FBI was aware of my presence as early as 1964. Because I never knew that anyone ever knew about me. But Zach Sheldon, from what I understand, and I'm only quoting this from hearsay, that Zach was the one that stated and gave me to Joe West the information on me, that I was in Dealey Plaza. Well, the whole thing is, like with Joe West, Joe West died. He passed away, never knowing that I was one of two shooters there in Dealey Plaza that day. Joe West never knew I was on the grassy knoll. Joe West went in for heart surgery, and from what I was told and what I understood, that he had come through it fairly well, and he was on the road to recovery. But then I was informed there was complications with his medicine. He was allergic to it or an allergy or something. He saw it, but they killed him. The medication killed him. But they killed him. The medication killed him. But they killed him. The medication killed him. Joe West had the case in court. He wanted to exhume John F. Kennedy's body. And that's what he was fighting for. And at this point, when I talked to Joe West, I explained to him that John F. Kennedy had been hit in the head with a mercury round, a special load. At this point, I explained to him, he can use this in the courts to have the body exhumed because there would still be traces of mercury because the traces of mercury do not disappear. It will always be there. The court had accepted his case. But with his death, the case died. I was in Mesquite, Texas, Saturday morning. Okay. Okay. But that's when Lee Harvey Oswald showed up at the motel where I was at. I arrived there on a Friday. I'm pretty sure it was Friday when I arrived there. Did you call anybody when you got to Dallas? I made two telephone calls when I got there. I called Charles Nicoletti, told him that I was on the scene, and where I was at, in case he had to reach me. I turned around and made another phone call. I called David Atlee Phillips. I had a number to call. The call was put through to David Phillips and he would notify it where I was at. Because I had not told him in advance that I was going to Dallas, Texas. And why did you call David Atlee Phillips? Because he always had to know where I was at because he was my controller. For? CI purposes, or special operations, or something that might be needed done. And you were supposed to stay in contact with him? We always stayed in contact. We had numbers to call. What happened after that? He said, thank you, and uh, let it go at that. We didn't have any great discussion on the phone. I told him where I was at, the location. And through David Alley Phillips is the only way that Lee Harvey Oswald could have known where I was at. But I had called no one, no one else. I made two phone calls. Where were you staying? I was staying at the Lamplighter End, right there in Mesquite, Texas. And then the next thing you knew, Lee Harvey Oswald. Showed. The following morning, Lee Harvey Oswald was there. He knocked on the door. I opened the door, and I was shocked to see him because I didn't think anybody knew where I was at except for the other two people. 
why is Phillips the only uh, one who could have sent Lee Harvey Oswald? Because Charles Nicoletti had never met Lee Harvey Oswald. He didn't know him. He did not know him.